John Lusk here of Lusk Archery Adventures. Series testing, successful hunting. Today I want to talk about broadheads and blood trails. One of the most common questions that I get from viewers when they're asking about a specific broadhead is they say, but does it make good blood trails? And you'll hear people comment, this broadhead makes great blood trails. That broadhead makes terrible blood trails. And you'll hear the same kind of statements made about the same broadhead. And so it gets really confusing and we want a broadhead that's going to give us good blood trails. So it's a fair question to ask. And yet it also reveals that maybe we're not really sure about what factors really do affect blood trails. So that's why I want to talk about it a bit here today. I think it's extra confusing for a couple reasons. One, because of marketing. That you see celebrity endorsements where celebrities will write a quote on the back of a, a package of broadheads or in a magazine or something, best blood trails I've ever seen. You know, something like that. We're like, oh, this, this broadhead's going to make great blood trails because that guy said it does. Or, you know, the package itself will just say devastating blood trails. And, and so we go, oh, you know, this should do it. This broadhead's going to make good blood trails. So the propaganda can really confuse us. And then there's also just the isolated anecdotal evidence. You know, this person shot a buck, hit it in the right spot, incredible blood trails, so then they conclude this broadhead makes great blood trails. Or someone else uses that same broadhead, doesn't get a good blood trail, and so then they conclude that broadhead doesn't make good blood trails. And so then they pass around that information and we get all confused about it. So I want to break it all down, and while I'm certainly no expert on this, I don't have all the answers, and, and please feel free to add in the comment section or correct some of the things that I'm saying in the comment section. I'd appreciate that. I, you know, I'm a pastor. I speak, you know, for a living, preach for a living, and I often make mistakes in what I say. So I'll probably do that in this video. Please feel free to correct me or add different things and go beyond what I've said. I really do appreciate that. We can all help each other in that regard. But I want to talk about this topic and share what you know, what experience I have, what information I have from my research and from my own hunting experience to help you understand a bit more about the factors that do affect bloodletting. One more qualifier I want to say, the goal in, in bow hunting is not to produce a good blood trail, but it's to harvest the animal, right? As quickly, as ethically, as effectively as possible. I know some people who hunt that their goal is, is not about blood trails at all. One friend in particular, his goal has nothing to do with, with blood trails. It's just, I want an immediate death, okay? I want to pin that animal down. I want to finish that animal quickly. So he uses an 1100 grain arrow with a really stout, tough, three blade broadhead. He aims straight for the shoulder and just puts that arrow right through both shoulders. And I mean, just kills that animal pretty quickly and often just drops it in its tracks. He hunts in a very uh, thick area. He doesn't want to be you know, tracking animals to kingdom comes. So he just, that's his setup. That's what he does and it works really good for him. But by and large, most of us do want good blood trails because an animal can go a long ways if you don't get that perfect shot. If you're not shooting 1100 grain arrow and you can't just drive it through both shoulders like that, we need a blood trail to find the animal and harvest the animal. I can't, I can't say how many times that I've thought, okay, I don't know if I'm gonna find this animal, but then you start finding the blood and then more blood and more blood, and then it either leads to the animal that's still alive or leads to the animal that's already uh, expired and you can just harvest it like that. But blood trails really help recovery. There's no question about that. So what are the factors that affect blood trails? What are the factors that affect bloodletting more than any others? Today I wanna to talk about six, okay? Six factors that affect bloodletting, blood trails. And there's many more. I could have made it 10, I could probably make it 15 or 20. There's a lot of different ones. But today I wanna to talk about the main six, the top six. The first has nothing to do with broadhead design at all. But it is by far the most important factor. I don't know if it's 90% or 80%, whatever, but it's by far the most important factor affecting blood trails. And that is shot placement. Shot placement reigns supreme. You could use a field point, or you could use like a judo point, or something like that. You could use a really small broadhead, and with a perfect shot, 
you can get an amazing blood trail. I remember this one time in Missouri, two consecutive days, I harvested a buck on one day and then a doe the next day. And the buck that I harvested was with this huge grave digger. Remember grave diggers? Okay, this had like a, it's a hybrid head, had like a one inch fixed blade and then like one and three quarter inch mechanical. I shot that thing twice in what I thought was a really good shot placement. There is absolutely zero blood. I harvested the animal. It only went like maybe, I don't know, 80 yards or something, under 100 yards. But I, I was afraid I was going to not find it at all because there was no blood. The next day, I shot a, a doe from that same tree stand with this tiny little two-blade, one and one-eighth inch broadhead. And there was blood everywhere, just like killer everywhere. It was like, it was like, you know, this paint trail that you could just follow. But it's not just because of the broadhead. It all had to do with the shot placement. On the buck, you know, once it was quartering toward me, once it was quartering away from me, and they were good shots, but they didn't get both lungs. Whereas with this, uh, this small little two blade, man, I hit it right in the sweet spot of the lungs. And though the hole was really small, the blood really didn't come out of the hole, but it really came out of the, the nose and the mouth. And that's why it was spread out everywhere. So shot placement is everything. And you can't conclude, well, man, this broadhead makes better blood trails than that bigger broadhead. You can't conclude that because I've used the same broadhead on other animals and had terrible blood trails. Okay, It's all about shot placement. But sometimes we get confused because we say, no, it was a perfect shot and there was no blood. I know it was a perfect shot. So let me address that a, a little bit here. We've all said it and I'm not trying to disrespect anyone. I've probably done the same thing over the years that you think you made a perfect shot. But sometimes what we think was a perfect shot and what really is a perfect shot are two different things, right? And it's a lot easier to blame the arrow than to blame the Indian. And so we go, it had to be that mechanical. It didn't open. It had to be that, that broadhead. Then someone else goes, yeah, I had the same problem. Those are terrible broadheads. So we, we all do that to a degree. But, but let me share a little bit here. Like when you think you've made a good shot, if you film your hunts, then you're going to know whether you did, in fact, make a good shot or not. I've thought, and in my mind's eye, a shot was perfect. And then I look at the film, because I, I started filming my hunt several years ago. I look at the film, I'm like, ooh, man, I hit just in front of the shoulder, or I must have hit that shoulder. I, I didn't hit in the lungs, or oh, I got a single lung. Like, the, the footage really does reveal the truth, whereas what I saw in that heat of the moment and what I remembered was really a different thing. So sometimes I think that happens. Another thing that happens is we don't account for the angle. So maybe we see the, the veins, the fletching of the broadhead or the arrow, and it's like right over the vitals. And we go, man, it was a perfect shot. But we don't realize with the angle, maybe the broadhead was hitting like eight inches below where those veins were. And so you see the veins in the right place, but it hit like too low or, or too high, or it was a quartering shot. And it's the veins look, or the, the veins look good in the right spot, but it's too far to the left, too far to the right. So sometimes I think that happens and we get deceived. Or with those angled shots, we look and we're hitting right where we're aiming, but we're actually, because it's a, a vertical angle like this going down from above, from a tree stand, we're going right under the, uh, the second lung or from the side we're going right around right to the left or right of that second lung and so we're getting a single lung rather than a double lung and a deer can live forever with a shot through one lung and there can be no blood so those are some of the things that affect what we think is a perfect shot then there's other factors about shot placement as well that we really can't control like whether the animal's lungs are inflated or deflated that makes a difference in the blood trails. How high you hit in the lungs makes a big difference in the blood trails. For those lungs to fill up to where they're, you know, the, with blood to where they're coming out of that hole, if you hit a high lung shot, man, that makes a big difference in blood trail versus if you hit them really low in the lungs. So that makes a difference. Or what happens when the animal is first impacted by that arrow? If it's on high alert and it reels to the side or it jumps up or springs, and that can affect the arrow's penetration. That could cause the arrow to veer off course. And you think it was a perfect shot, but it really wasn't because it didn't go through the animal like you thought it did. So those are some of the factors about shot placement that really can deceive us at times. And then it's important to remember too that 
no matter where you hit an animal, there's always a luck factor. And I had a buddy that, that shot an elk in the butt. I mean, he like shot and his arrow veered off a branch. He hits it in the hind corner, but gets his artery. There's like blood everywhere and he recovered it, you know, and I don't know, 150 yards or something like that. There was a time I hit an elk in the rear like that in the hip and man, there was very little blood. Sometimes there's just a luck, fa a luck factor or with, with a neck shot. It can be really similar. I shot one deer in Missouri through the neck. I was using a, a rage, I believe it was like a pretty long shot and I got pretty lucky. I hit it through the neck and and man, there was blood everywhere. There's another time, I didn't aim for it, but I hit a, a buck in the neck and there was very little blood. Sometimes just, I mean, a fraction of an inch this way or that way can make the difference between an incredible blood trail and no blood trail at all. So there's so many factors that affect it and there always is that luck factor. I don't know if you ever saw one of these articles. I just looked it up because I thought I remembered it and I, and I looked it up and saw the pictures of it. But it's about some guy that had this, this mishap with a nail gun. And here's a picture of his skull, okay? It's like copyrighted, so I couldn't show it here, but you can Google it. Picture of his skull with, with six nails from a nail gun in his like brain, his head, and his neck, like the base of his neck there, base of his skull. I mean, six of them, and he lived through it because they just happened to hit just the right place where it didn't cause lethal damage. Well, that can happen with a broadhead too, that maybe it was a perfect shot, but it was just that one little area that missed all of the arteries, and so you didn't get much of a blood trail. So there is always that uncontrollable luck factor for good or for bad, but no question about it. The most important factor when it comes to blood trails and broadheads is shot placement. But beyond shot placement, there are factors within the broadhead design itself that can make a difference. None of these are as important as shot placement, but these are important. So I'm going to give them to you in the order. Okay, one is, is shot placement, but I'll give the rest in the order the, of significance that I think they are. Number two is penetration. Penetration. How deeply does that broadhead penetrate into the animal? The thought being, if you penetrate all the way through and zip through, you're getting two holes. Two holes are better than one. I mean, getting double the, the, the faucets, so to speak, that the blood trail can come out of, and you can see it, you know, as you're tracking a deer, there's two different blood trails coming out both sides. Boy, penetration makes a huge difference. Or even if you don't get that pass through, the deeper a, a broadhead penetrates, the more tissue it's cutting, the more likely it's gonna clip that artery, get through that second lung, whatever it is, the more damage it's gonna cause, the more bloodletting is gonna result. So penetration is another factor. So a broadhead that penetrates really well will likely get better blood trails. But then there's a third factor, and the third factor is cut size. Cut size makes a huge difference, like a one inch versus say, like here's a four blade that the cutting diameter is one and three sixteenths inches, so like almost two and a half inches of cut versus a little over one inches of cut. Man, big difference in the amount of bloodletting that's gonna result all other things equal between these two heads, right? But then I have found that also it's not just total cut size, but the wider a cut is, the better the blood trail is gonna be, by and large. And the reason is if you get a wide hole, say versus a narrow hole, say you get a narrow hole with this head, you get a really wide hole with this head, what I found is the narrower holes don't stretch, they just kind of stay as that hole and they can tend to get plugged up by tissue, by fat or by organs or something like that. Whereas if you have a really wide hole like this, what I found is as that not only is it getting that big wide hole, but as the animal moves, it tends to stretch, the hide stretches, and that hole becomes even larger than the cutting diameter of the broadhead. Whereas again, just kind of a concentric rounder hole doesn't get larger, that longer slit does get larger. So the width of the hole tends to make a difference as well. Then when it comes to, say, mechanical heads, whether you have a, a, rear, a front deploying head or a, a rear deploying head, that makes a difference. So here, this is a, a schwacker, and you're gonna get the entrance hole is gonna be about one inch, okay? That's the cutting diameter going in. Then the blades open up and make a you know, really lot of internal devastation. If you don't get a pass-through, 
you're only going to have a one inch hole. And if the blood isn't coming out of the lungs and the, or coming out of the, the mouth and the nose, then that blood, the only way it's coming out is through that one inch hole. But a rear deploying head, you're guaranteed at least that initial big full cut. You're going to get two inches of cut in this case on the initial shot. And then if it doesn't pass through, again, at least you have two inches versus one inch. And then if it does pass through, then you got two inches on both sides. Whereas with this one, you only have one inch on one side, and then you got the two inches on the other side in that case. So having a rear deploying head, by and large, will give you better blood trails than an over-the-top deploying mechanical head. So cut size is a third factor in there. And then a fourth factor is the durability of the broadhead. I hear a lot of times people say, I don't care how durable it is, it's one and done. I don't reuse broadheads anyway. I don't care if it gets destroyed as long as it kills the animal. Well, I understand that, and that, that does make sense to a large degree. But what if it doesn't kill the animal because it's not durable? And I think that happens a lot more times than we realize. See, if you have a broadhead that, man, it starts off really strong and it hits that animal, but a blade is lost, well, man, then you're not getting nearly the, the internal cutting that you started with. Or if the blades are mangled and bent all up, you're not getting nearly the penetration that you were expecting. But if you have a broadhead that's going to hold together perfectly well all the way through that animal, then you're maximizing that total diameter of cut and penetration all the way through the animal. It makes a difference. Like with this head, okay, this is a Sever 1.5. It's one of my favorite heads. This head I shot through the, the scapula of a really nice buck here in Iowa last year. I mean, it penetrated super well. The rod head looks brand new. The blades still feel sharp. The point is really, you know, the tip is really pointy. I mean, it's like in perfect shape. So it's not necessarily that I just want to reuse it, though I can, but I know that I'm getting the maximum cutting ability all the way through that animal. You see, so durability does make a difference. One and done is not really a good philosophy when it comes to broadhead selection. Another area is sharpness and edge retention. Sharpness and edge retention are really important. Sharpness, just out of the box sharpness of the blades, how sharp is that blade, that makes a difference for that initial cut. But it's just as important, or maybe even more important, to see how well does that steel and that bevel angle retain its edge after it goes through that hide, after it starts cutting the tissue, after it hits a few bones or, you know, cuts through a rib or something like that. The thought being, again, that if you have an edge that's really sharp and that stays relatively sharp all the way through that animal, you're going to be cutting tissue more effectively than one that gets kind of chipped up, gets nicked up, there's edge chatter as it's called, like nicks in the blade, or that just loses its sharpness. It still may penetrate well, but it's not going to be cutting tissue as effectively. And I've heard surgeons say that, that the most difficult cuts to, uh, to, to seal, like to clot, are the ones that are the cleanest by the sharpest blades. Because if they're jagged and it's not like really a clean cut, then there's a lot more surface area for the tissue to, to grab a hold of itself and to bond together. But if it's a really clean cut, it's just much harder for that cut to clot. So you want a cut that's going to be really that you want a broadhead that's going to really cut effectively all the way through. I've also heard people say that a broadhead can either cut through a vein or can sometimes roll over a vein or roll over an artery because it's so dull. Now, I can't really prove that. I haven't seen that within an animal, but you can do it like with a rubber bands over a glass. You know, you can stretch rubber bands over the top of a glass and you can take a sharp broadhead and poke it through and it cuts the rubber bands. You can take a dull one and you push and it doesn't cut them through. It just kind of pushes them to the side. And if that's any indication of what happens to veins, then it makes sense that a sharper broadhead and one that retains its edge is going to be cutting tissue more effectively all the way through the animal. And that in turn is going to produce more bloodletting, a better blood trail. And then a sixth and final characteristic is rotation. And this is kind of just an extra one. And by rotation, I'm talking about two different designs. First, like a two-blade single bevel, or it could be a, a three-blade single bevel. Now they have those, like the Ozcut Hurricane, 
or it can be offset blades. Offset blades, like in a three blade uh, uh, fixed blade, can do the same thing. They cause a rotation within a medium. So you're not only shooting the, the, the animal with a, the broadhead getting that diameter cut, but it's also rotating as it goes through. Again, if you think about it with yourself, and if you were to get shot with a broadhead, you go, okay, I got a choice. I can either push this right into you, or I can push it into you and twist. Well, I know which one I'm going to choose. I go, just push it into me. Don't twist. Because okay? <laughs> twisting is just going to cause more damage. And that's what happens with a single bevel or with offset blades. That rotation causes extra damage. Now, it also impedes penetration. So you want to make sure that you're penetrating enough to get those two holes. But if you are, and you're already guaranteed that, or pretty much guaranteed that you're going to get a pass through in that animal, why not add more cut to it? by getting some rotation and create more damage. But when it comes to single bevels, though they're all in rage right now, a lot of times people misunderstand their lethality. They think because they rotate that they're like a buzzsaw and they're just drilling a hole through the animal. That, that's really not the case. You know, in an average deer with most single bevels, you're gonna get between about 7% rotation. That's like this. Or like maybe with the best of the best that I've ever measured, is like the, the Alien V2 here, because it's so wide, it's got a 40 degree bevel. The steeper the bevel angle, the better the rotation. So 45 is optimal, but then that's not really sharp. So 40 degrees with a thick blade, you're gonna get really optimal rotation. This one, because it's wide and flared out, it rotates more effectively than any single bevel head that I've tested. But even this one, you get like 70% rotation. If I shoot it into jail, 70% rotation. That's like this much. It's not even a quarter of a turn as it goes through an animal. So it's not like a buzz saw. It's just a little bit, okay? So it's limited in the impact. It's not like this incredible internal devastation. Oh, the innards exploded. It's just doing that, okay, within, a, within an animal. Now, that's significant to a degree. It's going to cut about, depending on the broadhead and the, the thickness of the animal and your setup, it's going to cut about 10 to 15% more tissue than a double bevel head would of the same design, of the, you know, the same cutting diameter. So that's significant to go 10 to 15% more cut with a single bevel, given that you know, both of them pass through, than a double bevel. However, if you use that argument, you go to a three blade and you add in an extra blade over a two blade. Let me go back to this one. You add in an extra blade, well, now you're getting 50% more cut than you would with this. So 50% versus going to single bevel, I get 10 to 15% more cut. With a three blade, man, I'm getting 50% more. Or if you go from a three blade to a four blade, same cutting diameter, you're getting another 33% more tissue cut. So you see, that's a lot more significant than the rotation of a single bevel. Now I understand the rotation of a single bevel also can split bone, it can help with penetration, but I'm saying if you're getting a pass through, you're gaining about 10 to 15 percent more cut with a single bevel, whereas you're going to get a lot more cut with a three blade or a four blade if it passes all the way through. So those are my top six factors, okay, when it comes to broadheads and blood trails. When I'm choosing a broadhead, here's how I use these factors to, to help me select a broadhead. First of all, like as I talked about, the most important factor is shot placement. I want a broadhead that flies really well and that I'm totally confident is going to fly well when I'm nervous, I'm in windy conditions, I have a quick snapshot, I'm trying to weave it through brush, the animal's moving a little bit, something like that. I want to make sure that I'm practicing enough, that my form is good, my technique is good, and my broadhead and arrow flight are very forgiving so I can make sure that I'm maximizing my chances of getting a really good shot, okay? That's one thing I think about. The second thing is I want two holes. I want a head that's going to give me a good chance at zipping all the way through whatever animal I'm, I'm hunting. And it's going to make a difference on that animal. If I'm hunting a smaller animal, well, I can use a, a one broadhead. If I'm using, you know, hunting a bigger animal like this Cape Buffalo, I'm going to go with a smaller head where I'm maximizing penetration. But so I want a head that's going to give me a great chance at a pass through. Okay, then third, I want to cut as much tissue as possible while still getting that pass through. 
So that may be using a, a single bevel where I'm going to get a bit more rotation. I can still get a pass through. Or it may be a three blade or a four blade or something like that. Or a, a mechanical, a really wide cut, a rear deploying mechanical, a wide cut on the entrance and the exit. But as long as I can get a pass through and a good chance of that, I want to cut as much tissue and as wide of a hole as possible. As, a, as that broadhead is going through an animal. And again, that varies based on the animal size, based on my arrow and bow setup, and so forth. Then the fourth factor is, I want a broadhead that's gonna be durable, that's gonna keep its shape, that's gonna keep its form, that's not gonna bend, it's in impede penetration, it's not gonna break, and maybe still penetrate, but get half the cut, because one of the blades is broken. I want a broadhead that's tough enough, has quality materials, is a sound design, that's gonna be cutting effectively all the way through that animal. And then fifth, I wanna make sure that I've got a broadhead that is really sharp, and that also has really good edge retention. So I'm maximizing the effectiveness of that cut as it retains its, its full dimensions and as it makes a wide cut and cuts a lot of tissue while it's getting that pass through after flying really accurately into the kill zone, okay? So if I do that, if I can get a, a broadhead that flies well, passes through, makes a, a, cuts a lot of tissue, makes a really wide cut, stays intact and keeps that wide cut all the way through and is really sharp and retains its edge so it's cutting effectively all the way through, then I know I'm going to be maximizing my chance at a really good blood trail. So when you're thinking about broadheads and you're wondering, does this broadhead make a good blood trail or not? Forget what you read on the package, okay? And, and honestly, forget what you hear from different, you know, anecdotal evidence that, you know, somebody shares this experience, that experience. Think about the broadhead design itself. Think about these factors that I've talked about, because those are the factors that by and large affect blood trails more than any others. So I hope this is really helpful. Again, our goal is to harvest these animals as quickly, as effectively, and as ethically as possible. And so I hope this helps you to do just that. <laughs>